welcome you all all for a very very important organized by chamber of industry I am thankful to my colleague, Mr. the Senior Vice President of BCIC, together with Dr. Virapan, the Chair of ICT and Electronics Committee, for uh, spirited this activity time. I special to Mr. Sanjay Naik, CEO and Managing Director of Tejas Network, uh, Mr. Baska, Senior Director of Deloitte, uh, Mr. Ishwaran, Partner Deloitte. Uh, Mr. Shaker, my colleague, and senior vice, and also Mr. Balasub, the chairman, direct, and uh, taxes expert committee, and uh, Dr. Virapan uh, for uh, comparing this event and uh, organizing it today. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy that this topic has come at the very right time when the whole nation is looking at a great revival opportunity. And uh, this is one of the most sought topics uh, that has been discussed in the last few months, especially in the light of the Atman Nirbha. Uh, create a comeback, I would say, and uh, manufacturing a renaissance song by the entire team of Niti Aayog, spearheaded by none other than our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. And this scheme is almost focusing on an investment of close to 200,000 crores. Okay, in the starting point, to be precise, 1,45,890 crores spread over the next five years. And as a part of making India the manufacturing giant in the next five years, make India the manufacturing hub of the entire world, improve the competitiveness of manufacturing, to compete with the global players, attract investment in close to 10 sectors in the areas of core competency and cutting edge, ensure efficiencies and economies of scales are realized through low-cost manufacturing, through technological adoption and manufacturing competitiveness, and enhance exports and make India the part of the global supply chain and uh, the focus sectors being advanced chemistry cell, ACC, the battery cell, which is the talk of the town, especially in the light of the emerging EV technologies, which India is very keen, and the government of India already announced initially 100% electric mobility policy by 2030, then uh, government said 30%. I think it's a great move. In fact, today, if you look at the global, uh, wrote the globally less than 2% are electric mobility. And from there, if you are looking at a 30% mobility in the next 10 years, it's a very massive jump. Then uh, electronics technology products, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Virapani, I think a series of softs have been announced by the government of India to promote electronics manufacturing. I'm sorry, uh, I'm lost in the network. Hello. No, you're fine. No, this. You're fine. Yes. 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 Yeah, pharmaceutical drugs, telecom and networking products, textile products, food products, high efficiency, solar PV modules, white goods, and specialty steels. And the key point of uh, the whole activity is this time the PLI is based on an incremental number, which means the base year is taken 1920. So the incremental performance is taken into account rather than the input at one time, like the other mega schemes. So this is a very big boost to the manufacturing sector. And uh, four to six percent of incentives can be realized in the next five years. So this is a, going to be a great a game changer. And I'm sure uh, it will take India to the next level of global competencies. So we have uh, experts from various fields are going to address on this uh, particular topic. And uh, I'm sure that there will be a lot of value add today. And the members will take home a lot of uh, inputs. And uh, this, uh, again, the team is a very, very And uh, they have expertise on various fields. And I'm very thankful to all the key speakers today. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Parasuram. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning uh, to every one of you. 
Uh, welcome to this webinar on PLI incentives organized under the aegis of Direct Tax Expert Committee and uh, ICT Committee headed by Veerappan and Bala and Tapti and uh, Sunil. The team has a tremendous job in organizing this webinar. Uh, this webinar, as Parasraman mentioned, is very topical. And uh, we have speakers uh, from industry as well as in profession to address this issue. In fact, uh, Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce is the forefront. Uh, we had a discussion with uh, Mr. Piyush Goel one month back on the various aspects of the economy, Atma Nirbhar, and various uh, aspects. And we had almost one hour discussion with Piyush Goel and followed by another 30 minutes discussion with additional with the Ministry of State of Finance. Uh, in all our interactions, the government was very keen to improve the manufacturing sector. And one week before extending the PLA to all the sectors in our interactions, the central government, they asked the views, what would be the way you will look at it if you need to extend all the sectors? And we gave a thought paper, how it would be beneficial if it extends to all the sectors. So the chamber has been at the forefront in interacting with the government, not only the central government, but also with the state government in making sure that the, that the industry gets utmost attention from both the governments. And I'm happy to inform you that uh, the Honorable Union Finance Minister, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, has agreed to interact with our members on 21st of December, Monday. Originally, it was scheduled to be on 18th. Uh, due to other appointments, they shifted to 21st of December for uh, 45 minutes or one, 40 minutes to one hour in the evening. Uh, so I request all the members and participants here to give you a perspective what the chamber should take up to Malasita Raman. And we also invited uh, Mr. Anurag Thakur, the Union Minister of State for Finance, and Nitin Gadkari, and both of them have agreed to address the chamber sometime coming months. So from a chamber perspective, we are at the forefront of discussing with the government of both in central state, and we look forward for all your support and take. Coming back to this topic of PLI, I don't want to take the, I don't want to steal the thunder from my good friend Sanjay Nayak, who is uh, extremely well known in manufacturing and electronic industry. And uh, Sanjay Nayak is the managing director of Tejas Networks Limited. Uh, he has got uh, extensive experience in manufacturing and the telecom side. And he also heads the uh, yeah, and has been, he has been at the leading with the Prime Minister office and various central government and research and development side. So we have a speaker from Sanjay Nayak who will be addressing on industry issues and aspects. What is expected out of PLI? Then we can expect. Can I request others to mute their phone? Mute, please. Then we have Mr. P. S. Ishwar and partner then we from the P. S. Ishwar and partner, and he is expert in supply chain and PLI. So he has also been talking from Deloitte perspective with the government. Uh, he has given us a different perspective on PLA, what are the challenges, how it needs to go about it. We have Mr. Baskar, an indirect tax expert, who will be talking about what are the indirect tax specific aspects on PLI. Of course, followed by a panel discussion, which will be anchored by Tapti Ghosh and Mr. Veerappan. Uh, I don't want to take much of the time, but I should thank Veerappan and Tapti Ghosh for coordinating and putting this uh, very good uh, webinar. Thank you, Mr. Veerappan, and thanks a lot, Mr. Tapti Bush, for doing it. Uh, over to you, Sanjay, for your comments, Sanjay, on PLI. Uh, thank you, Shekhar. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be uh, addressing um, such a uh, good group of people at BCIC. So I'm very delighted to uh, be at today's event. Uh, I think there's a background noise from someone. Uh, if, if you can put them on mute. Okay, perfect. May I so request just, uh, everybody to put it on mute. Uh, other than the speaker, I request everybody to put their uh, video as well, block your video as well as put the phone on mute so that it will enhance up bandwidth and you can listen to the speaker properly. That's all my request. Go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you, Shekhar. So, so coming back to the, uh, uh, the PLI scheme, which is being talked about. Uh, so I think one thing we should do is that look at the big picture of what the government trying to do. So at a high level, uh, you know, we have the clarion call of the Prime Minister for making Bharat as Atman Nirbhar so that we can be self-reliant. So what systematically the government of India has done in a very logical way is picked out the sectors uh, where a few things uh, are, uh, you know, possible. Uh, number one, I think we should have a very large domestic market because that's a good way of creating economies of scale. 
And to give you a few examples of that, uh, electronic uh, is one area where if we don't do anything, you know, if we don't promote domestic manufacturing, uh, import of electronics uh, will be more than that of oil. And given the current oil prices, uh, that the event might have already happened. Uh, so that's point one, that look at sectors which have large domestic things. The second one after electronics, which I'm also quite familiar with, is the telecom sector. If you look at the telecom sector, every year we import around 10 to $15 billion uh, worth of telecom equipment. And with the two big events of 5G as well as uh, fiber to the home, especially post-COVID, uh, there is a situation that over the next five years uh, to build a nationwide 5G networks and a nationwide rollouts of uh, fiber to the home, we may be investing anywhere between you know, 50 to $100 billion. So I think it's important that we leverage this opportunity. And similarly, there are many other sectors. So number one was to become Atmanirbhar, look at sectors where there's a large domestic demand. The second thing which we need to look at, which the government is you know, keenly watching, is the new geopolitical situation around the world, where, for example, uh, there is a lot of uh, anti-China sentiment in many parts of the world, in many segments of uh, the industry. And India, uh, with the trust factor that we have, uh, can automatically uh, take a space, the vacant seat, which uh, in many places has been created because of uh, you know, the anti-China sentiment. For example, many countries, including UK, uh, have banned or U.S. have banned the use of telecom equipment from China and clearly there's an opportunity for someone to step in and I think India can do that. So really look at export opportunities which are of a very large kind. So large domestic market, large export opportunity. Again, since I come from the ICT sector, let me give you another example of the kind of export opportunities this uh, scheme can really create. Uh, for instance, if you see India over the last five to seven years has possibly gone through the world's largest transformation of a traditional economy to a significantly digital economy. And this transition actually happened on the foundation of three different pillars, uh, which are you know, broadly called digital India. But the first pillar was really the, the network, nationwide network. So in the cities, we had people like Jio and Bharti and others building the network. And in the villages, uh, government took a very ambitious and forward looking call of uh, BharatNet, which basically made uh, you know, high speed fiber optic connection to 150,000 villages as of today, and as the Prime Minister announced on 15th of August, it will be 650,000 villages in the next few years, next thousand days to be precise. So large network, and then the foundational software of Aadhaar, UPI, and all the DigiLocker and everything else, and on top of that, all the apps, whether it's for telemedicine, e-governance, financials, et cetera, et cetera. So the Troika of network plus foundational software plus the, the software has created a very large export opportunity because around 100 countries in the world today are having a budget of anywhere between $1 billion to $10 billion for doing this kind of a digital transformation. And India can step up to the plate and actually uh, be a partner to many of those countries who need trusted source, which India has. So I think this is a large export opportunity. So coming back to the big picture, Atmanirbhar is not about just creating self-reliance because of import substitution as well as possibly export. And there's a third dimension of, an, uh, of uh, I would say, strategic interest, you know. So for instance, we all realized in the last nine months that telecom infrastructure, digitization is, is a very significant part of our economic well-being. And if the networks are compromised, if our security is compromised, I think the country will basically come to a standstill. So in strategic sectors, whether it is, you know, pharmaceuticals, where we need to have access to our own things, or telecom, or electronics, or defense, I think we need to become self-reliant. So all the different sectors which the government has chosen are related to these kind of big picture being solved. So that was the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is for India to become a global manufacturing hub, uh, government has figured out that there are two different approaches and they are complementary, I would say. They're not one at the expense of the other. Is A, you have to attract FDI. Now that is a very good thing because uh, global supply chains are integrated. Uh, no country can say that I have 100% of everything that is needed uh, to build a particular product. So I think attracting the best in class, the global guys to come to India, and especially as people are diversifying their supply or, or manufacturing base from China to other countries, I think India has a fantastic opportunity. If you really see in the first four or five months after COVID, uh, there was a lot of uh, move of manufacturing shifting out from China to countries like Indonesia and Vietnam. And really, I think India uh, needed to do something proactive uh, to attract that global uh, FDI. So I think that was one part. And the second one, which is equally important, especially for, I would say, knowledge-driven uh, manufacturing or 
high value added manufacturing is that we have to create our own competencies and let me give you an example both from electronics as well as telecom for first of all if you see uh, the way the value chain of a telecom product works uh, around 50% of the value is from the ipr the the design and so on and so forth so for instance if you look at uh, iphone uh, you know out of a uh, you know 699 dollars worth of iphone apple makes 499 dollars and uh, you know they make that much money and 300 dollars goes to the bill of material and the physical manufacturing is even a smaller portion but at the same time apple doesn't own any factories so the design led manufacturing of the kind that an apple does or a cisco does or a, a many other such companies do i think that is india's strength so i think we needed to encourage our domestic industry to to really use design led manufacturing and of course get the global uh, uh, players uh, for setting up the large factories and the two together i would say would really give give out the best value from india's point of view the second thing i think we should think of is that there are only maybe a handful of countries five countries in the world if i were to say which not only have the technological firepower but they also have the capabilities of all different kinds which are needed to build end to end products and again let me give you an example if you take the telecommunication equipment you'll be surprised to know while we say that we import all the product from abroad and does india have the capability there's a couple of facts which are very uh, you know uh, uh, interesting more than 50% of the engineers in the world who are designing telecom products if you take china away are actually based out of india and similarly if you see the semiconductor chips while we do not have our own foundry uh, it's a matter of great pride that probably more than 50% of the chip designers of the world if you take china out are again based in in india and a significant part in bangalore so the point i'm trying to make that talent is available in the country uh, we have uh, domestic capabilities we have a domestic market and that's why the pli needed to become very important so coming back to now the pli part itself so i think there are right. of ict manufacturing i think there are three things uh, which we would like to see uh, the the uh, electronic manufacturing pli is already out for mobile phones and associated things for telecom it's been approved but the details are not out so i really think there are three things which india should do in terms of policy intervention and when we detail out these schemes number one is i think we should promote both uh, the design led manufacturing which is the highest value addition uh, uh, as well as of course the factory led manufacturing that we are all very familiar with and within that uh, there is a provision in the uh, mighty policy for electronics where if you do transfer of technology or if you invest in capital investment uh, that is counted against the investment i think for knowledge driven products and which could be in, whether in electronics or telecom or it could be in pharma or it could be in any other things we should make sure that the r and d which is mainly manpower and and i'm sure shaker from uh, deloitte is very well aware of it that manpower constitutes the largest part of r and d so i think that should be counted as an investment because it is better for the country to allow manpower investment in count that towards r and d capital investment versus doing transfer of technology and paying foreign people or foreign engineers for the same job so that was one the second thing i feel is that the thresholds for the investments as well thresholds for growth etc uh, should be set up uh, so that the msmes don't get left out so while we are attracting the fdi we also should encourage our msmes who have been suffering a lot of handicap and i think those msmes need to be promoted and to promote those msmes it is very important that the appropriate thresholds for the investment as well as all the other obligations are set up because the msm is needs hand holding at this stage and we cannot afford a situation where uh, on day zero we ex uh, we expect them to make large scale investment because we do need with them to become successful and then the third and the most important part i believe uh, which has not been addressed in the current policy uh, which is for the mobile manufacturing is there is no correlation to value addition in the country if we really think about manufacturing in the industry 4.0 or whatever new things new way of manufacturing i think it is all got to do with value addition and you could do manufacturing which is just screw driver technology and you could do maybe 5 or 10% value addition or you could do very high end manufacturing you could do 60 70% value addition in the country so if the pli incentive does not take into account the difference between someone who does 5 to 10% value addition within the country or someone who does 50 to 60% value addition i think is not a right thing so so our suggestion as the policies come out in the final shape is to really link the value addition to or uh, link the amount of pli incentive to the value addition that is being done within the country otherwise we may have a situation that 
someone does six percent validation and take six percent uh, uh, PLI versus someone does sixty percent validation and also get six percent PLI. So I think that is something which, especially for knowledge-driven or high high-tech manufacturing, I think there has to be a linkage which should be established to validation. And this is something which I'm sure from BCIC and others we can give the feedback to the government. So these are really the three points I wanted to make in terms of the detailing of the policy. Otherwise, I think it's a fantastic policy. It it allows uh, the domestic industry to to get past the handicap. We are in a chicken and egg situation that unless government supports, we can't kickstart the manufacturing, especially in sectors like hardware and others, where China has got this policy will really bridge the gap uh, in terms of the handicap that the domestic industry has. And linking with the Make in India policy, the preference to Make in India policy, which is already there, uh, we will have a demand pull from the domestic thing. So the, so the PLI policy linking with the Make in India policy. And the third aspect I think we should also link is the export promotion. So I think we should be promoting high-tech project exports from the country, which I talked about is a very large opportunity. So when you link all these three things together, uh, I'm pretty sure we will have a compounding effect and, and the vision of the prime minister in many sectors to become net zero importers of many of the high-tech products or, or, or really become a, a surplus uh, you know, uh, uh, exporter in many, many segments can actually be and truly realized. And once the economic value add happens, once the domestic happens, I'm pretty sure that the domestic industry as well as the economy will benefit from the, 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 impact, uh, from the uh, effect of all of these policies coming together, which in turn, of course, will lead to jobs, will lead to economic well-being, and of course, self-reliance in, in strategic sector. So that's really where uh, I would like to pause. And again, I feel that it's a fantastic policy. The implementation details uh, are still awaited in many sectors. And I think if those can be tackled in the right way, uh, we can truly uh, get the benefit of these excellent policies that the government of India has come. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sanjay, for your uh, opening remarks and your uh, I, I, and knowing you, you are always extremely positive about creating a domestic manufacturing. And I think uh, in your view, in your assessment, this PLA incentives create that sort of space for domestic manufacturing. Thank you, Sanjay, for your remarks. And I request you to be here for at least another 45 minutes and request you to participate in the panel discussion, Sanjay. I know your busy schedule, but I request you to be spare your time for BCIC today, Sanjay. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Shekhar. Thanks a lot, Sanjay. Uh, what you, Tapti, you can now request Ishwaran and you can take it forward now. Thank you, Shekhar, and thank you, uh, Sanjay, for uh, that uh, pretty overwhelming uh, those short uh, uh, call out on what the uh, objective of the government is, what the path uh, uh, the path we are on at, and uh, the nuances on how India can benefit uh, through the schemes that the government has rolled out. Uh, we will uh, take this forward to the next part of uh, the session, uh, which is going to be uh, led by Ishwar. Um, Ishwaran is uh, a partner in uh, Deloitte. Uh, he has over 14 years of experience in, the, in industry and uh, consulting, uh, focusing primarily on manufacturing a vertical. Areas of expertise include um, uh, uh, supply chain, manufacturing strategy, and so on. Um, so uh, over to you, uh, Ishwar, uh, and uh, Bhaskar uh, has already put up the uh, slide deck on, on the screen. Thanks, thanks, Tapti. I think, uh, you know, Ishwaran, I think before uh, one minute, Ishwaran, one minute, only one minute, Ishwaran. Uh, Mr. Veerappan, who is the president of ICT committee and is a managing editor of TESOL Semiconductors, he has got his, uh, we would like to hear his views and also request him to take it forward after the conclusion of Ishwaran and Baskar. Ish, uh, Mr. Veerappan, you would like to hear your views and then take it for the moderation session also, Mr. Veerappan. Okay, okay, KRS. Thanks, thanks. I will. I will. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Shekhar. I think uh, just continuing and Tapti, maybe we can have it on the full screen. Uh, uh, so just continuing from what uh, Sanjay said, you know, what I would uh, I would do is, uh, you know, really talk to you about what the construct of uh, the PLI scheme is uh, and what is the significance of that to 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 companies and what are what are those dimensions that you should be looking at uh, as the scheme comes up in many of the sectors. If we can go to the next one, I'll first give you a lay of the land as to what the objectives are. So I think some of the objectives and those were aspirations that Sanjay also spoke about are really the objectives with which the PLI has been formed. So if you really look at the PLI, the PLI is primarily a financial incentive. 
and it is essentially to boost domestic manufacturing and at the same time attract investments both from domestic organizations as well as global organizations into india so those are the twin objectives at a very high level that the government is trying to look at now, as they do this i think the the primary purpose with which they are doing it is to say i think there could be areas of cost arbitrage that would exist and those are cost arbitrages can actually be bridged uh, through this incentive scheme uh, if you look at the government's uh, schemes per se uh, most of the schemes that they have launched over the last 6 uh, months there is a triangulation i wouldn't say the last 6 months because some of them came a little bit earlier so if you look at the dimensions there are three parts to it right the first one is really where we are talking about plis which will provide financial incentives for manufacturing and attract investments the second is to enable that you also have now an opportunity to bring in world class technology in terms of machines in terms of input materials etc where there is an inbound manufacturing which aids exports as well as domestic manufacturing by a deferment of duty and that can be a percentage on your ebitda that you can actually save the third one is obviously from a corporate tax perspective where they have the 15% uh, corporate tax for some of the new entities so essentially what they are trying to do is really address the dimensions of supply chain and manufacturing investments which they had not over the last many years in terms of reforms so that's uh, that's essentially where the the first dimension is the second one that that is uh, very clear is that with that in context there are three primary objectives that they would want to really achieve and all the schemes that we speak about are actually acting in unison therefore one of the things that you may also want to look at as a firm is as we speak about pli there are other dimensions which can have a significant impact on both your revenue growth as well as your operating margin which you may want to look at so if you take that in perspective the first one that the government is trying to do is to really look at the global plus one strategy how can we really attract value chains to make in india and become therefore competitive because as we become more aligned to the global value chains our competitiveness index also goes up substantially and just to give you a point one interesting point of view is that the value chain index of india is about 0.41 the value chain index for china is about 0.44 not very different just that there is a five time or a 5.5 times difference in the economy and therefore scale is a big barrier otherwise if anybody wants to look an operate look at an operating model of a company in which is present in let's say some of these countries and if they want to shift the operating model to india either partially or fully you don't have a problem so the, that's what the government is trying to attack first which is essentially around the attracting the shifts in the value chain per se the second that they are trying to do is to really enhance with that in context the global value chain participation and make india a part of the global uh, supply chain itself so you would have seen there are themes around um, uh, textiles where we are talking about mmf that is really fitting into the scheme of things i'll talk about that a bit and the third one is really i think uh, sanjay you were checking out as to how what the government should be doing and i think the fundamental intent that they have published is to increase value addition and incentivize value addition therefore that is the third construct that becomes very relevant now what's the focus right and therefore it also gives us a view as to what what segments will come in i don't think this is the end of the pli we'll have more sectors because when i looked at the champion sectors for manufacturing there are about 15 sectors not all 15 sectors have been covered so far in the pli therefore i would also expect that some of the others to come in you know no information but i believe it would now if you really look at the focus the first focus is obviously to look at uh, enhancing exports attracting investments which is essentially core investment so if you see the pli scheme itself it says obviously it's sector specific but broadly in many cases the land and building is not being allowed and therefore they are trying to say you really at put in money in investments which will churn out uh, assets for sale the second one is around sectors which will have a high employment potential which has been a big area of focus for us and the government and the companies have created maybe you'll have to go on with it otherwise i'll do a bit like with lilia and i'll come back could we expect request everybody to go on mute yeah i muted everybody else so thanks uh so the second one that we'll really look at is employment uh, potential generating uh, sectors and you would have noticed that we have one for textiles electronics that um, was spoken about just now 
and also many of the others which are in the in the middle of cutting edge technology which we are seeing in other electronic products so this is essentially the theme in which the overall structure is therefore as you start looking at pli my advice is that you also start thinking about the other dimensions that could make your your entire investment far more profitable and you know play on the interlinkage between the multiple things the second is that many of these are isolated from what's already things that you are taking in for example be it the state incentives or if you are really looking at some msips or many of the other ones many of these are independent of that therefore you also have the advantage of ensuring that you are able to play upon many of these things independent of what you currently have in perspective so that's that's possibly my first point the second one when and baskar uh, request you to go to the next one the second one that you may want to keep in 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 context as we go by is the the focus area so just to give you a a view i think pharmaceuticals medical devices and large scale electronics the pli has already been announced the guidelines have already been in place and also in 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 large scale electronics uh, across the three categories where 20 companies are eligible already 2016 have already been approved and there are some applications to choose from and you would notice in each one of them that the number of applicants are actually significantly far more than the number of applications that would be approved and therefore there is a strong uh, i would say patronage for this both from global companies which is evident from both uh, medical devices as well as large scale electronics as well as with a large in- set of independent indian companies which is evident from pharmaceuticals so if you look at pharmaceuticals about 83 companies have applied including all the big names and about 21 applications have been received so one of the good things about pli is let's say there are multiple segments and there are sub segments of the pli you know only in a particular sub segment you should not apply twice but across the multiple sub segments in pharmaceuticals for example the multiple sub segments are the multiple key starting materials or the input materials you could actually apply across therefore one of the advantages that that you would you would have is flexibility but with flexibility therefore comes the requirement to be prepared for the pli in terms of the business plan and the scenarios etc so a number of things that companies are doing and which companies did obviously when they applied and many of them have also been approved etc is to really start looking at the best level just not a scheme because there will obviously be global and local interest there is obviously enough patronage as visible from the earlier ones the government themselves have shortlisted it based on like what i said a set of parameters where we could participate in the value chain where there is some economy of scale where there is uh, opportunity to have export income where there is you know potential for um, uh, improving employment so there are a set of filters which have already been applied and to that extent you would find that there would be high patronage and therefore the ability to actually become a pretty important business case for pli in my view is a very critical requirement for organizations even as the guidelines come out etc so that would be my second submission outside the first one where we look at it as a holistic picture beyond just the pli but a larger set of things now if you go down to the next one and i will also tell you the characteristics of each one of them right as identified by the government so forget the small font you know i thought it's easy to put it in a page rather than meandering pages so if you really look at it for every segment that they have identified the pli for the government has also stated in their pib release the direction of the pli so let me take two or three things which are extremely different and for you to understand where they are coming from so take food processing you know in food processing if you really look at it we have uh, desi ghee we have ready to eat and fruits and vegetables and if you look at the primary direction that they have stated it is product lines with high growth potential and capability to generate large scale employment have been identified for support so very clearly i think as the pli comes in you will have dimensions of investment you will have dimensions of scale you will have dimensions of employment as being big drivers to that second is uh, if you really look at uh, what has been done for let us say looking at uh, telecom products and i think uh, there was some reference to large scale electronics first thing is really to attract large investments from global players and second is at the same time also enable domestic companies to become large players in the export market so if you really look at the objectives the very clear these categories that would come up and therefore that also becomes an extremely important dimension for us to start thinking about uh, very similarly if i were to look at uh, 
white goods where there is also a non tariff barrier right now i think in white goods the, there is a non tariff barrier especially for air conditioners it will lead to more domestic manufacturing generation of jobs and exports so essentially the direction of the pli for each segment is very clear and with that direction we'll have the categories and maybe also an influence on the preparedness that you as organizations looking at pli because it's extremely difficult for you to ignore this in the sector because fundamentally you know if you are really getting to reduce the cost arbitrage and therefore neutralize some of the negatives uh, from a cost perspective compared to the other countries then you know it's extremely difficult for you to ignore this therefore my view would be that you also strongly look at what the direction is as released by them look at the fine print and also start thinking about how we are how your business will react to a pli application you will typically get about 90 to 120 days once the guidelines are out you know in many of these cases the guidelines are not out but expected shortly you will get it's not as if you'll have to do it tomorrow morning but essentially you will get about 120 days and that's pretty much a short time for you to do a lot of things right with that in perspective i'll also talk about uh, you know what a typical process looks like and maybe i'll stop there with that so basker if you can kindly go to the next one it's possibly my last one I think there are two, three things which are in consideration, right? The process itself goes through an application um, um, sequence. And if you look at the past ones, I think the approvals for large scale electronics was done pretty quickly, matter of two to three months. Therefore, I think you can actually get a lot of things done pretty quickly. And therefore, you know, it's not going to be a very large time frame. Base years, et cetera, will come in 2019, 20 seems to be the base year, but could change for some of the upcoming ones, depending on the year and month of their launch, et cetera. But whatever it is, I think if you really look at the dimensions that you will have to think about, the first one is you know the nature and structure of the entity, which would be in PLI. Some of you may be in joint venture entities. Some of you would be in uh, you know Indian-owned entities, multinational entities. Therefore, the nature and structure of the entity and linking it back to the incremental revenue that you spoke about. The second is therefore the construct of the business plan itself. And one of the things that we have been noticing, and at least in some of these stages, we had the opportunity to to be with companies which were submitting their plans. I think a couple of things that came to our, our perspective was one, a very strong clarity around the addressable market, the cost curve that you're going to go to, including a plant cost decline model that you would want to look at, the portfolio definition, because the portfolio definition obviously has to align with the PLI in one perspective, but also the addressable market on the other side. And therefore the technology deployment, because one of the things that the government is extremely clear about is that they don't want you to really bring in uh, you know, technology which is completely a very strong business plan extremely important because as I said earlier, if you look into the first, it talks about the details, the revenue, EBITDA, etc. For us, with this business plan, business validation, and employment generation, as well as the proposed investment. And many of you as leaders and CEOs really start thinking about scenario planning for the range of uncertainties. And the thing that in the earlier PIs are also there is that you, you know there is a cumulative model that is working. Therefore, that's particularly fine. But if you're not achieving it in a particular year, there is a one-year grace which is there. But you need to, you can't be consistently. Uh, be behind in the overall type program because they also have others waiting in. Therefore, my submission would be one, take it in totality but together with a couple of other things that we spoke about, be it inbound, be it uh, the corporate tax structure, or be it uh, the PLI itself. That is one together. The second one is really look at uh, the, the objectives of significance that the government is looking at and align your themes and your strategies to, to look at how that both of them uh, merge. There are no big deviations, frankly, because all what they are looking at is really to enhance domestic um, investments, accelerate employment, and really create competitive organizations who so can't be anything different, but just have, have a look at the priorities. And with that in context, really start thinking about what you should be working on as organizations, which would, in my view, have a set of things which are not typical application filling and just providing it. I think there is a fair degree of strategic thinking that businesses have to do before they embark on this journey. So uh, that's broadly what uh, I thought I will convey from a PLI perspective. Uh, the schemes, guidelines, I think we have, uh, you know, Ms. Vera and Baskar and uh, Tapi to, to talk about many of the, the, the finer details of the schemes and also the lookouts from uh, tax perspectives and other dimensions. 
but i thought from a from a larger strategic agenda of looking at the pli you may want to really focus on uh, these sets of things and ensure that you are you're right up there when you start filling in a promise so that's broadly and tapti thank you and uh, over to you and uh, thank you baska for helping me with this and uh, tapti over to you for this thank you ishwar uh, please stay on uh, we we'll want you at the uh, for the panel discussion as well um, now over to you uh, bhaskar quick introduction to bhaskar he's been with uh, deloitte for the last uh, 17 years or so prior to which uh, he was in the manufacturing uh, industry and hence uh, has good rich on the ground experience as well he's our indirect tax partner uh, in uh, no, deloitte he will be covering the pli incentives uh, per se and um, maybe uh, you know what what we can see as a way forward over to you bhaskar bhaskar you're on mute yeah so can you see my screen tapti i yeah yeah we can yeah thanks. Thanks. yes sir yeah thanks tapti um so thanks ishwar sanjay and shekar and tapti in terms of uh, the pli as uh, sanjay and ishwar was just giving a context uh, what we have today is some kind of a comparable uh, with the 10 new sectors which is electronics and as ishwar rightly mentioned there were 16 companies which got approved under the scheme there are five international phone manufacturing companies in the mobile phone invoice value 15000 and above segment out of this five international phone companies three phone companies were the contract manufacturers of apple foxconn vistron pegatron and there were some other multinational companies as well and uh, in terms of uh, the local manufacturing companies there were companies like micromax lava um uh, and other Uh, domestic companies if you just look at the incremental investment in four years uh, pursuant to this pli scheme is uh, 1000 crores for the 15000 and above segment for any applicant and 200 crores for domestic companies and 100 crores in the sec segment the total production uh, expected is around 10 point uh, the total production of over 10.5 lakh crores in the next 5 years Of which incremental production over base year would be around one lakh crore. Um, this the PLI for electronics, sixty percent of the incremental production is contributed by exports, and a sizable portion of forty percent uh, might be catering to the domestic population, and this is something which is very very good because some of the incentives which the government is giving in the form of the PLI. um can be or could be offset by the incremental gst collections there is an additional investment to the tune of 11000 crores it is expected to generate something like 2 lakh direct employment and around 6 lakhs indirect employment and the value addition is going to be um increase from 15 to 20% to 35 to 40% this is broadly the update in terms of the electronic manufacturing i am just just giving this context because we will get to know or we can just contextualize in terms of what could these things mean when the guidelines are announced for the 10 new sectors if you just look at uh, the guidelines as sanjay did mention the guidelines are not yet out for the 10 new sectors but what i thought uh, it would be appropriate is to just pick up few key features of the existing guidelines which is mentioned in the electronics manufacturing and we should definitely look out of look out for these kind of guidelines in the new sector as well one of the things in the pli scheme and uh, is that the applicants can operate the existing facility or they can also propose the new manufacturing facilities of course it has a direct tax uh, dimension to this but if you just look at all these incentive schemes including what ishwar alluded to in terms of the inborn manufacturing the government is fully focused on the incremental investment incremental revenue and incremental job opportunities and incremental um, export contribution and things like that they are not bothered whether you are just putting in money in the existing facility or the new proposed facility we can just pick up a leaf from the le latest uh, inbound uh, uh, facility as well and the government has clearly called out saying that the existing factories can also convert into inbound manufacturing and for people who are not aware of the inbound manufacturing 
it just very quickly in less than one minute inboard manufacturing um, is a license which the existing manufacturers can apply and defer the custom duty payment till such time you manufacture the goods and clear it to the domestic market so even there the government has announced that uh, the existing facilities can get converted into a inbound manufacturing facility and similarly the existing manufacturing setups can get converted into the new pli scheme a um, couple of uh, other features in terms of the eligible expenditure the good news is the all the plant and equipments are covered as part of the eligible investment the associated utilities like the etp or the captive power plants are covered in the as part of the eligible expenditure uh, even in terms of the r and d as sanjay did mention the capex on r and d is specified in the guidelines uh, i am not sure in terms of the manpower and things like that but of course the capex on the r and d is included in the eligible expenditure and uh, the transfer of technology cause everything is included in the eligible uh, criteria of the investment which is a very very great thing um, as ishwar rightly mentioned that the applications are not going to be open for multiple years it's just maybe for 3 or 4 months and i have come across cases where people have missed the bus in terms of filing the application and they are waiting uh, for the government to just reopen the applications and uh, they are queuing up for making an application even for the electronics manufacturing uh, pli uh, one of the quick call outs is in terms of the non eligible expenditure the land and buildings are not covered um, so i think uh, the same thing would uh, be forming part in the uh, proposed guidelines for uh, the 10 new sectors and also one uh, quite interesting thing is since we are just talking about manufacturing Uh, they have borrowed the definition of manufacturing from the GST Act, and for people who have dealt with excise, it's quite the same. So you should put some inputs, and you should just bring out some new product. Emergence of a new product is something which is re- very relevant, and the concept of deemed manufacture, like labeling or relabeling or packing or repacking, may not be uh, considered as a manufacturing activity. Um, the other point uh, or the other feature in the existing guidelines is. Uh, one of the criteria for qualification and eligibility is the consolidated global revenue of the applicant and that is something which is uh, which is uh, important if uh, if you receive more number of application as compared to what is exp- what what can be given in terms of the pli um, the government is going to rank them in terms of the consolidated global revenue um, so the larger players might get a get a better ranking as compared to the uh players who do not have a significant global revenue and more importantly maybe it is not mentioned in the guidelines sanjay did mention about the value addition maybe people who are adding more value in india might get a better ranking um and uh, one other call out is as ishwar was mentioning that it is not filling a four page application or a five page application but make sure that you have a strategic uh, thinking on and make sure that uh, you file the application after uh, strategically thinking in terms of what is the investment and what is the uh, incremental sales and uh, and uh, any excess incentives which i'm i'm just saying that this if you do not perform there is no penalty but if you if you just position something and if you get an incentive of pli and if it is if the government finds that it is in excess of what is due to you they might charge you an interest the good news is there is no penalty for not performing but uh, if there is any excess uh, disbursement uh, that has to be paid along with the interest back to the government yeah so in terms of uh, uh, the key pointers for the new proposed 10 sectors this is something which is very very good uh, this schemes are wto compliant you know for a matter of fact uh, we lost the case uh, against the complaint filed by the us and uh, the wto ruling says that we need to just bring it down or bring down all this incentive schemes which are linked linked to exp- exports like the meis the export oriented unit schemes like the ehtb btp epcg and duty free import authorization schemes all this has a limited shelf life and we are just we are technically we have filed an appeal before the appellate authority but sometime or the other we need to just reengineer the schemes but pli is going to be a is a wto compliant scheme that is what uh, we understand and that doesn't uh, 
uh, doesn't uh, contravene or any um, uh, agreement with the WTO. As I mentioned that 40% of this incremental production is going to be catered to the domestic market. The incremental GST is going to just defray some bit of the PLI incentives or the outlay which government is giving, which is a very good thing. And uh, because of this pandemic, a lot of MNCs are looking for the China plus one supply chain model, which issued its peak. And keeping this PLI, keeping inbound manufacturing, keeping several other things like the faceless assessment, um, like a EAEOT to registration, this will definitely India will become a, a China plus one. India will definitely become a alternate uh, destination for China or an additional destination for the supply chain thing. And the other point which I wanted to make is um, in terms of uh, the purpose, um, it definitely reflects the intent to improve the prospects of domestic manufacturing in India. And you would know that 142nd position in terms of ease of doing business in India in 2014. Now, as of now, we are on the 63rd and tax is one of the significant matrices in terms of measuring ease of doing business in India. And as I mentioned at the risk of repetition, the whole of inbound, the whole of um, customs initiatives, the PLI schemes will push this uh, ranking further from 63. And the goal is to be within 50 is what I was uh, given to understand. And uh, in terms of the timelines, uh, it was initially expected that this schemes or the guidelines will be out uh, within 45 days from say November. We were expecting something to happen uh, this month. But I understand uh, from the secretary from BPIIT um, as per his latest press release that it might take three to four months, but uh, the stakeholder consultation has already happened. Yeah, so we should expect something. And as Ishwar was mentioning, maybe the base year for this may not be 1920. It could be um, 2021, uh, but uh, we need to uh, look for uh, the fine print as and when they are announced. So that's all from me, Tapti. Thank you, Bhaskar. Um, and now uh, just to turn it over to Dr. Virappa and, and a quick uh, introduction to him. Uh, Shekhar's, of course, mentioned uh, that uh, he's our lead uh, in BCIC for the ICT and electronics uh, vertical. Uh, he's also uh, the co-founder and director of Dissolve Semiconductor, has rich 33 years of experience in various companies like Sterling Electronics, uh, DCM uh, Data Products, Wipro Technologies, Motorola, uh, BPL Telecom, uh, and so on before uh, he uh, he moved on to uh, Tithol. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Virapan, maybe over to you for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for a quick overview of what, um, uh, you know, your views on the PLI before we go into uh, the panel discussion. Good afternoon, all. I think we have about 60 participants uh, today in this uh, meeting. Uh, Sanjay, uh, very, very happy to meet, uh, meet you with you again. Uh, uh, no, Sanjay and me are working for the last like 20 years in this. Uh, I will tell you, uh, India is a software services country. You all know, right? So the moment you say hardware, there is some uh, like uh, jig everywhere. So, but Sanjay, is a successful hardware man in a software country. I can say that way. Very, very few companies have succeeded in making a box or selling a box or making a hardware manufacturing. I think uh, congrats to Tejas Network and Sanjay, who has done this very well. And with all the odds, it is not that they have, they swam very nicely like Wipros and Infosys of the world. I think the, the journey with Tejas went through he knows. He knows better than all of us. I know to an extent that what all the difficulties they gone through. You all know the three mantras for anybody to invest in any company today in the world is less capital. They don't want to invest in more capital. They want high margin. Then they want short term ROI. This is the mantra. You know, we want to get our money back, return on investment faster. They are talking about three years and four years and five years. And the margins, gross margins in software companies are 35%, 40%, and they want EBITDA of 20, 22, and so on. And also, they don't want to invest anything on visionary capital equipment. 
I think that is why the software industry, you know, right, with these three mantras have really taken them. Whereas if you take into the hardware, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are all in that segment where we have to invest a lot of machinery capital. Then our margins are, because the, the cost is known to everybody. When you know you buy, sell something, a box, the cost of the box is known to the entire world. So the problem is you, you cannot make big margins out of it. Um, somebody can make, but generally you can't make big margin. And also you have to invest for equipment. You have to invest for uh, all the things. Normally in a hardware, the return we are talking about is 8, 8%, I say maybe 10 years, nine years, it's a long term. It is never a long term, three year or five year. So with all these uh, three odds, I think Tejas has really uh, taken up very well. They're making good money, they're profitable, they're giving money, you no, know, they're, they're worth to the investors and all of them. I think my first congrats, for a successful, very few successful hardware companies uh, in India. I think I think Sanjay, kudos to you and your team for keeping this uh, boat going and going and still you know, growing also. That That's wonderful. Here, I just want to tell all of you, more than the PLI, you know, we are all like uh, passionate hardware people. So me and Sanjay, you know, from Diane and the Maran's days, we have been pushing this hardware. The, the word, what we told on that day is, nobody was shaking up, central government, the state government, about electronics. So what we told is, guys, if you are if you are going to live like this, the import of electronics is going to be more than import of oil, which is number one imports today. This is the jargon which uh, Sanjay knows very very clearly when we are, when we are talking about to the central government ministers, the IT ministers, and the IT secretaries that we told that if you are not waking up now, we have slept from 1987. We have slept for so many years, please guys wake up. This is an important sector. We are importing so much of electronics to the country. I think that changed the whole paradigm. I think we can see from then onwards, so many policies into electronics and hardware sector is coming. I think the government is, I, I think the problem is not policies. The problem is implementing those policies. Policies of, you know, maybe all the policies inputs were given by people like Sanjay, or like how many inputs he has given to uh, to make policies, IESA or MEIT or you know, CMA or BCIC. Most of the organized industry bodies are giving CI, giving input to the government to make the policies. Unfortunately, the implementation of those policies, you know, we have to really push. I think Sanjay spoke to, I still remember his talk four years back in this IT.com, everywhere he tells, please guys, implement the policies properly. It is not announcing the policies. So here also the PLI also, same thing, right? It is not announcement. We have to see the success of these policies. More and more our companies are coming into this segment and succeeding. This is number two. Number three, you all know, right? Why we are in this state, you all, all of us know very clearly. Most of this electronic 100% is duty free. You can import all, see, we are in semiconductor segment, ICs. ICs, you can import duty free. And, uh, and I'm very, very sad to say that, you no, know, in India, we don't make one integrated circuit, IC, commercial. We have some fabs in India, which are all government-owned fab like SCL or BL or whatever is there, but we don't manufacture one commercial integrated circuit in India. But we consume all, you know, everywhere, whatever we use, you name cell phones, televisions, refrigerators, cars, bikes, all of them use ICs. Immaterially, semiconductors, they're in every part of our life today. But unfortunately, we are some 130 billion people, X, Y, Z, so many people, we don't make single IC out of India. This is the fact. We are talking about a fab in India for the last... 14 years, uh, Sanjay knows about it. We, we announced a fab policy, nothing happened. So to be very, very, very sad, we are we are not making a single IC out of the country. This is this is in semiconductor industry. So basically, we are allowing everybody to import duty free. So what happened is, so making in India, if you come out with something, it will be costlier than import. Then who will manufacture in India? The whole point is that if somebody has to manufacture in India. They have to get actually some benefit or they have to make money out of this manufacturing. So this is known to all of us. So this PLI is tended towards that 6%, whatever they are giving on revenue. So I think that is going to bridge the gap of the Indian companies. If you manufacture, you can also globally cover it. So where is what happening is uh, the volume, see like China, we are talking about China, Taiwan, where they are all electronics like big time. Why they are big time? Because the volumes are very high. 
what i see we want to do something in india we want to buy a pcb for example we want to buy a pcb in india or import whatever it may cost you say one dollar whereas you can get the same thing in china for 30 cents we are talking about 30 to 50 percent cheaper than what you get in india so what is the incentivize to manufacture in india so what happened is we have neglected this hardware electronics manufacturing as a segment for so many years from 80s onwards i think all these south asian uh, asian countries have really grown well you know countries like vietnam countries like malaysia countries like i can say philippines or big country of china if china if taiwan and even other smaller countries in our uh, south asian segments have really done well in electronics manufacturing so this inputs have gone to government many times and now we are we are we are uh, telling them guys please make sure that this hardware industry electronics and hardware manufacturing industry you have to give the right respect this is this is the message which has gone very strongly in many of our forum that don't treat this this is like a stepmotherly treatment so don't think see software is really your focus you're done stpi you're given tax relief you're given so many things that's why the software industry has gone so but we don't want india to be a services world services world you know we have become like a complete services country i think now good news is that we are we are seeing a lot of changes in the last like couple of 10 years or i can say that a lot of things are coming up to promote uh, hardware as an industry the pli scheme is one of that one of that which is definitely going to boost but again we, we have to wait and see that which are all the companies are applying it, we should get the benefit like companies like tejas companies like tesol companies like indian companies should get benefit i am also seeing companies like samsung companies like <laughs> are making for apple foxconn Foxconn, Flextronics, all these companies are not Indian companies. Anyway, anyway, that's okay. They, they have done well in, in our country. They have also value adding to the country. That's okay. But we as an industry in India, we want a lot of Indian companies to come up in manufacturing, like Tejas. So what we are telling is there is a good opportunity in the country. From our point of view, we are all here to tell the government, you know, please, please help the sector. This is a very, very wanted uh, sector in the country now. So in the next, like if we focus on the hardware, electronics, manufacturing se sector, seven, eight to ten years, I think we will be one of the largest uh, manufacturers of electronics in the world. You know, consumption is really, you all know, consumption is really going crazy. Telecom, you know, right? Telecom, we are, we are the number one in telecom. We are almost crossing the subscriber space. We are not touching to, we are crossed now. We are number two in subscriber space. The mobile users. Then you see all the things, right? People have gone crazy in India on electronics. So this is the right time for all of the industry body like BCIZ to push this to happen. I think wonderful presentation by Ishwaran and uh, Baskar for us on the PLI. So we are all here to to you know here to get the benefit of this scheme and make India a, a, a electronics manufacturing destination. This is in summary my my submission. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vrihapan. And maybe from there, uh, if I, uh, there were a lot of references that you've made, and I'll uh, maybe turn to Sanjay right away. So the, uh, the devil is in the detail, and we don't have the details uh, as far as uh, the new regulations are concerned. Uh, so in the context uh, of uh, telecom networking uh, equipment and electronics and uh, technology products, uh, Sanjay, um, what do you think, or maybe what would your recommendations to the government be with regard to uh, the detail and possibly with respect to the implementation as well that Dr. Uh, uh, Virapan, uh, you know, alluded to and the challenges well, that we faced in the past? Sure, sure. Sorry. Uh, th thanks, uh, Tapti, and uh, thanks, Virapan, for being so generous with your words. Uh, we have just done a <laughs> little bit. We still have a long way to go. But uh, coming back to the uh, coming back to the specific things that we are looking forward in the policy, as uh, Virapan said, devil is in the details. So let's say um, for the telecom equipment sector, I think one fundamental uh, thing which would be good to do is it's a knowledge driven. A telecom product today really uh, is hardware is the base, but there's a lot of IPR and software that goes on top. So I think we should be at a high level promoting uh, what the prime minister said a few days back at the. India Mobile Congress design-led manufacturing. You know, we should really uh, promote that. So that's one part. The second thing, I don't know if it is possible, but 
the government has explicitly stated that they want to promote, if you see the intent of PLI policy for telecom that uh, earlier was put up, uh, that they want to get FDI as well as promote the domestic company. So I would say just to avoid the what I would call the land grab by the foreign company like what Virapan said, maybe the 12,000 crore PLI incentive which has been set aside for telecom uh, and it could be done for other sectors could be split half and half. Half could be for FDI and half could be for domestic companies. And within the domestic companies, then we would potentially uh, encourage more companies to come. So that was the second thing I would say so that we don't have a land grab by uh, foreign OEMs and the domestic companies get left out. The third thing which I think is very important, uh, and it is again uh, mentioned earlier that uh, validation in the country uh, will go from 15 to 20 percent to 30 to 40 percent. I think it is important that the linkage of the validation is actually made to the incentive. If you just keep it as a motherhood statement that the validation will increase from 15, 20 to 30, 40, uh, nothing is going to happen. Uh, people will continue to uh, get away with the path of least resistance, which is doing assembly uh, and low level stuff. And India would never benefit uh, from doing the high value add because value addition finally is what India retains. Um, everything else is passed through. So I would say that the incentive should be linked to value addition. So it could be, say, 25% uh, of the value addition if you do. So if you do 40% value addition, you get 10% PLI. If you do 20% value addition, you can get 5% PLI. But uh, I think that would be the third thing, which uh, which would be very important. Uh, fourth thing in terms of implementation, uh, and this is a, a larger uh, comment I wanted to make uh, regarding any policy in the country uh, across sectors, where if you have to get money from the government, uh, it's a very difficult proposition. Uh, when you have to give money to the government and they choose not to take it, it's a very easy thing. So if you see the IT services industry over a 30 year period, uh, when they were given that uh, tax break, that you don't have to pay the taxes to the government, probably cumulatively about $100 billion of incentive was given to the industry, but government did not write a check uh, to the industry. If you contrast that with the MSIP scheme, uh, which uh, you know uh, was uh, set up for the electronic sector, getting a check out of the uh, MSIP scheme, even though you qualify, went through so many hoops that uh, only a handful of companies would have actually got the payment uh, released under the MCIP scheme. So similarly, since the PLI scheme is again an, uh, a scheme where you would actually be getting the cash from the government uh, and the, the amount of incentive could be large, I think an alternate mechanism uh, as an implementation can be suggested, which is that you may get credits in the form of uh, you know GST payments or income tax payments that you get so that you use that credit and you don't actually physically have a cash outflow once your uh, application is approved. So I would say those, those would be the uh, implementation tweaks uh, that one, one has to be looking forward to uh, to make the policies uh, more uh, really uh, effective to the industry where industry actually gets benefited out of it in the near term itself. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sanjay. And uh, given the pandemic, I'm sure, you know, cash flow related uh, issues are something, uh, you know, that uh, more, uh, the industry is really looking at gra or grappling with. So uh, some of these suggestions, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have made it to the industry already, but uh, through BCIC also, it's something that uh, we could possibly take forward. So uh, Ishwar, um, is there anything that uh, you would want to add to these comments? Um, oh, I think, uh, you know, obviously, uh, like what uh, Sanjay said, I think the practicality of things is where I think the government has to work on so that, you know, the experience is seamless. And given the fact that we are going to have a set of interlinked ones like this, and, you know, you know that many of the states are also revisiting their uh, industrial policies right now. And that also has the same dimensions of reimbursement, the same dimensions of incentives, etc. So I think at a larger level, I think uh, to establish the, 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 the credibility of the ecosystem and to ensure that these things are uh, completely seamless, becomes a very important driver, not just for the current, but also into, into the future. The second, I think, which will be very important is as we go through sectors, uh, possibly the balance, I think, uh, also was mentioned earlier. The right balance in terms of uh, the players also need to be looked at because if you go with specific criterion, which can only be global revenues or for that matter, investment in assets, while it will in the short term create uh, uh, you know, employment, it could also have a tilt towards uh, the skew of uh, industrial development that we witnessed for the last many years. Therefore, I think 
it's also in our best interest that some of the sectors like food and agro processing etc are also far more diversified into the cluster so ideally my view would be that they should follow the arpanirbhar alignment where they have said that so many uh, clusters would be identified so if they are able to look at the the synchronization of the multiple initiatives rather than looking at each of them isolated um, i also recognize that many of them will be run by different ministries but uh, that is something that i would look for so that you know some of what um, sanjay said are uh, fundamentally addressed up front rather than even on the mechanics of so that's what i would uh, i would submit uh, right uh, and Ishwar, uh, to go back to the PLI per, uh, per se, uh, can an organization have more than one application in a sector? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned this. See, if you take pharmaceuticals, which is a classic case, uh, but you know that's where you know the 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 the, the dimension that I said the the focus product, the focus portfolio, and the focus business plan becomes very relevant. You know, it, the the simple answer is yes, right? That is what I would have said. But my urge to uh, to leaders and CEOs is to say, and I found this to be pretty wanting in many places, is to say, uh, what should I be applying for? You know, you also want to be in ACC batteries. You also want to be an auto component. You also want to be morphing as an automotive company. You know, you really don't know what you are up to. And you know, the people on the other side who are evaluating are as much confused as you are to say, what do you stand for? What are you known for? So my submission would be simple answer: yes. But I would think that leaders take a call as to what best fits in, where they can channelize all their energy. See, one is getting the PLI, but second is executing it because it's also focused on incremental revenue. And assuming that the rest of the administrative stuff is cleared, then the onus is on the company now to perform to that expectation. Therefore, you know, while I'm sure force majeure, et cetera, would be taken care, I think this is uh, this is really something that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we as CEOs need to be looking at. That would be my... And maybe you know I'll 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 turn it to Sanjay as a CEO to react to it, but uh, that would be my submission. You know, answer is yes, but just be see in pharmaceuticals it's a little bit of a different equation because you're just only dealing with different variants of intermediates. So that's a completely different ball game. It's like saying okay I'll I'll do for castings, I'll do for forgings, etc. That's a very different game compared to saying you know on the end product side I'm going to be very different. So that's that's my personal view. Uh, and Sanjay, maybe you know you can add to it based on your experience. No, I think um, in terms of the uh, category, so let's say within telecom, uh, you know, you will have two, three product, four, four product categories are mentioned. Uh, clearly, I think, um, uh, for example, we do all four of them or three of them at least, you know. So, so, so I don't know one application would be for all of them or would it be for uh, each product? I, I don't think that clarity is there, but it has to be that, you know, all of them should be covered because in this, it'll be difficult that a company who is doing, as you mentioned, the auto case, you know, batteries could be different and auto assembly could be different. So I think those things do need to, uh, will require a little bit more thought process. But within the same segment, um, it should be fungible whether you you manufacture product A, which is in the focus scheme of product B, because actually at the base of it, it might all, all be the same product. Uh, in fact, with the convergence, a smartphone is a mobile phone and, and, and a computer as well. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's got to recognize that a lot of uh, convergence happens in terms of the uh, product uh, manufacturing level. Right. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Sanjay and Ishwar. Uh, that was pretty detailed. Uh, maybe to change the lens slightly and a question for Bhaskar. Uh, so Bhaskar, if an applicant does not meet uh, the sales or investment threshold, is there going to be a penalty? What What is the intent? Yeah, so Tapti, in terms of uh, the penalty, the guidelines is not prescribing any penalty, at least the electronic manufacturing. Um, but definitely, uh, they will not get incentive in a particular year. And if they have defaulted in a particular year, they might move to another year. But what is not very clear, Tapti, is assuming on the manufacturing of the phones, the first year the applicant is supposed to get a 6% incentive. Assuming the applicant does not make good this numbers or they make good the numbers in the first year, on the third year they don't make the numbers. So if you just look at this, the incentives are very, very graded. The first two years 6% each and the second two years are 5% and the last year is 4%. Should we skip the whole year or this one year which is attributable to some kind of a non-performance will just get carried over in terms of the rate? The simple answer to your question is the applicant will not get, there is no penalty, 
but what is uh, important is whether this one year non performance will be allowed to be carried over to the next year and the same rate of incentives will be made applicable because as ishwar was mentioning we need to just go to the management giving them the story in terms of why any applicant would like to go for a pli 1% might make lot of difference uh, keeping in mind uh, what dr veera also did mention so no penalty but need to be mindful in terms of while making the application thanks uh, thanks bhaskar uh, i see that uh, shekhar is back uh, he had stepped out for uh, um, uh, a call i'm sorry yes tapti go ahead yeah uh, so uh, shekhar maybe a question uh, for you i know that you've been having a lot of interactions with the government um, uh, but if and uh, you uh, wear the uh, hat of uh, uh, tax sme as well uh so given the manufacturing pli the low rate of tax uh, in uh, income tax corporate tax is that enough um what more uh, can you expect from the government sure that very thank you so much for tapti and uh, see when 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 my last three or four interactions both the finance ministers as well as the officials in the government office said that the government is very keen to improving manufacturing sector and they said that we are looking at manufacturing not just for india but for, and also for the export and to that i interact I, my counter was that yes you look for export but india needs more manufacturing so don't look at manufacturing export look at manufacturing and india and make india as a manufacturing hub and at that point of time the government what i understand from the government was that and that's what the pla was expanded to all the sectors and uh, what my understanding based on the couple discussions is that though there is a, some sort of amount that has come out that this much of amount, some 40000 crore 50000 crore what are the amount but the way i look at it is if the pla application this project or the incentive scheme is successful the government may extend it beyond what is required after some point of time because the government is very keen on improving the manufacturing sector and the government did also ask me in the interaction what it came out means that i i be informed from bcs and me also of course from a delight we had both uh, sanjay kumar and arinda was also there in the couple of actions uh, what we said is that if you need to improve manufacturing in india you need to improve the r and d also in india because r and d is very critical to manufacturing you cannot improve only man we can't have manufacturing of only what i would call the desktop manufacturing just put some boxes put something and make it as bit that cannot be the right way of looking at manufacturing and india has got a tremendous skill sets on the research and development there's a lot of synergy between r and d and manufacturing and need to improve r and d for the purpose of benefiting the mass and they asked me uh, what to what do we do and my my response to them was that we had a 35 to ab reduction under the income tax act now it is completely phased out and you need to be granting the world benefit of 100% tax reduction for it because that's a very important sector or you give the 15% concession rate of tax to r&d companies too today the definition of manufacturing under the income tax act manufacturing and r&d together but if the company is doing an exclusive r&d and they are not in the manufacturing but an exclusive r&d that r&d is aided for man for let's say for a minute <laughs> If they just set up an ex, they just need an iron because I I know Sanjay, I've been working with they just for last twenty years from the last ten over they just started. So if Sanjay and I decided to set up an exclusive R and D entity, which will help not only they just for today but for they just tomorrow, there's no tax incentive for R and D unless that R and D is linked as a part of the manufacturing company. So the idea is that we need to improve the R and D side from the manufacturing that will create a big boost for the manufacturing sector. and they asked for the recommendation we gave the recommendation to give a, to cut the answer short you first question tapti the government is very keen on reviving the manufacturing and improving the manufacturing and the government is also looking at very seriously improving the research and development sector not a service sector per se not the typical it services or the technical services but a pure r and d set that's what the government my understanding based on the interaction the second one we asked a very valid question about the manufacturing under the income tax and manufacturing fund pli the concept of manufacturing and income tax is completely different from the concept of manufacturing under pli so it is important that you you accept as a manufacturing and pli income tax act says it is not a manufacturing for example in a healthcare sector in why healthcare in any consumer product sector any sector you import you assemble it 
and then you carry it on necessarily due to the technological advancement you don't need that old types of manufacturing where you input the raw material do the process and all where entire manufacturing is based on the technology side so there must be some sort of a synchronization of the manufacturing both under the income tax and pl like uh, that is more critical and the last one is that which me and ishwar did discuss and one of the points that we need to take it to the government is that msme sector is also important part in manufacturing because if you look at the entire msme statistics almost 40% of the msme sector is covered in the manufacturing that too in five five states in southern states tamil nadu andhra and karnataka and uttar pradesh and north east states uh, eastern states so msmes are the most critical part in the manufacturing but i don't see anything pli for msme sector so if you ignore the msme sector and to what extent for example most of the manufacturing companies may look for ancillary or component parts manufactured by the msmes so you need to extend the pli to msmes also then it will be a whole r and d a full blown manufacturing and for msmes that the entire chain would revive the entire ms manufacturing sector in india and that is what my view is yeah thanks uh, thing I, and maybe to take it on uh, further from that uh, uh, you know and uh, sanjay alluded to uh, china uh, de risking uh, uh, ensuring we have a more seamless uh, supply chain uh, and so on so uh, india as a manufacturing destination uh what would be our strengths and challenges uh, uh vis-a-vis the geographies in the region because many of the other geographies are also moving uh you know, global companies into india sanjay maybe some thoughts on that yes yeah, so i think um, if you look at let's say there are uh, who are the competitors for india in let's say uh, high tech manufacturing in the world today so clearly china is one uh, the second set of people who have emerged effectively is the southeast asian Uh, whether it's a vietnam indonesia philippines or malaysia to that level uh, that's the second competition a uh, block if i were to say and india clearly and and i don't think uh, we we have more global competition of in in the same league somewhere else so if you compare all of these three uh, different buckets and let's leave china aside india's strength against uh, the asean uh, manufacturing uh, economies is i think uh, two major things i would say are very important with india is a leg up and i think government and our policy should amplify our strengths number one is that india has design capabilities the one which shekhar was saying that if you look at the new way of manufacturing in the world today or what is they call is uh, you know industry 4.0 or manufacturing whatever whatever there is a huge amount of knowledge inputs which goes which is related to r and d uh, both in terms of the processes systems fundamentals everything so i think india has a world class ecosystem of being actually a global leader you know even equal to china or better in what i would call design led manufacturing so i think we need and design led manufacturing i'm not just talking about design led manufacturing in electronics or telecom where it is well understood but even if you think about if you look at pharmaceuticals if you look at other sectors if you do the ipr the knowledge part and you do the manufacturing i think your value addition could be high so number one india has an advantage a competitive advantage is, is having a large pool of design led manufacturing talent available in the country the second thing which we have which i think the government is trying to link and i think the linkages can be made more holistic like uh, you know uh, ishwaran mentioned earlier not look at the pli policy in isolation is our large domestic market so i think we got to link the large consumption with our manufacturing with our ipr creation and these troika together give us the advantage so if you look at Vietnam by itself is not as big an economy and neither is Malaysia or Philippines compared to India right so i think we got to leverage these two strengths large domestic demand second uh, the availability of talent to be able to be a leader in the world in 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 design led manufacturing these are the two things i would say would be important there's a third one which is a soft issue but definitely very important in this uh, new geopolitical world is this trust factor you know there india has a very unique advantage in the world today where the country can be trusted uh, by the western world uh, which is basically going to be uh, sourcing their products from around the world uh, because if you see the way it services industry or the services industry at large has worked out of india we have really gained the trust of the world that confidential data uh, can be sent to india and we can be trusted so i think and networks today for example need to be trusted you cannot you know compromise on your security so i think that's the third soft advantage india has is a credibility or a track record of being a trusted partner
for anything in future. So I think those would be the three things India has uh, as an advantage compared to the others. Thanks, Sanjay. And maybe if they can, uh, you know, tackle the challenges with regard to land allotment and uh, maybe our labor laws, which of course uh, they are on a path to do, and uh, you know, minimize litigation that we've we've been known for. Uh, I think we'll we'll also make a good amount of headway. Uh, so maybe uh, Dr. Virapan, if I could, uh, you know, uh, shift the lens uh, onto you as far as BCIC is concerned. Uh, how uh, how uh, would BCIC be enabling the industry to address you know the benefits that are coming out of these reforms? Uh, okay. And maybe to add to that, is there anything else be beyond uh, PLI uh, that we should be recommending to uh, the government? See, I think thanks. Really the, 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 number number one is very clearly our members should be aware of this incentive. See, most of the problem is many of us is that we all know the policy is announced and so on. The first, first and foremost, BCIC's intention is to make sure that all of our members are aware of the policies. I think that we need to go with workshops, seminars, or some booklets so that the policy is very clearly known to all the BCIC members, create awareness, number one. Then second is most of us mix miss on the eligibility criteria. Most of us know like this 100 crores, first year one, year two, and all those things. So we need to make sure that the eligibility criteria people are aware. That is number number two. So then we are, we are planning as a BCIC to help, uh, set up a help desk. I was speaking to Kaya Shankar and Parasuram and said to get, set up a help desk for us to make sure that our members can, we can help them to apply. See, the problem is the application has got so many things. So we can help the members to uh, apply and also follow certain process. So we sort of uh, support our members too, that that's we are planning to make sure that their policy help desk is also provided in BCIC. The, the, these are all the two majority of the things which we are, which are planning. Then again, workshop like this, like you know, um, uh, leaders who have gone through this, like Sanjay and others can come and talk to our members about their experiences, and so on. Next week, we have uh, the FOSCON uh, person, uh, Fol Josh Folger, is uh, talking to our members by this month end. So, like that, we have more uh, people who can come and share their uh, you know, pra best practices or how they got it, what is the benefit, and also we benefit the members. Then, fourth part is definitely that we will ask person the implementation. Again, I, we had a meeting la last day also, uh, but two days back in BCIC. I have informed very clearly. We need to go back to the government and tell them it is not the policy. It is where is the gap? Well, where is the issue of implementation? So we should go back to both state and central government and talk to the industry people and come back and go present, tell them this is the gap which is the policy announced and the implementation. So that we, it is not that we are supporting the thing. We are also telling them where are the problems. This is the industry body's objective to tell the government, guys, no, you need to different. As Sanjay said, one policy I, I still remember on the solar. They said 30% uh, all the panel incentive is given. Uh, you will get back. So what has happened? All the people who have put solar panels, the 30%, uh, most of the people never got the money back from government. Same way, you know, you know, Nokia's of the world, you know, all these people have put their factory. Then they said it is reimbursement. It will come back to you. You pay the tax and everything. It will come back to you. Huge money, thousands of crores have not come back to these people even after years. So, what do you have? What is uh, I, I agree with Sanjay that getting the money back from government is not that easy. So, if we are able to push PLS, I see because they are telling you do this 100 crores, you submit, you will get 6%. So, it is not upfront. It is after you perform, after you bill, after you invoice, you prove, then you get back this money. So, we need to make sure that. People get the money on time. The government should also be clear to pay back the incentives on time. So I think the industry body can make sure to tell government boss very clearly, this is what the support you have to give it to the industry. They have met the commitment. The government has to meet the commitment. So we need to, BCIC is planning to act as a body between the industry and the government to make sure that the implementation also is smoother. These are our plans, uh, more than PLI, uh, the second question is, see, PLI is announced now. As Saker said, see, if we take automobile uh, as a sector, how it got grown, it is not the very clearly automobile from 70s 
I don't know whether lobby, X, Y, Z, you call, you cannot import a car, duty free. See, Mercedes or today, BMW, you know, we pay through our noses. No? If you buy a, a Mercedes today, a GL, it's one crore, 10 lakhs, S class is two crores and so on. Whereas in the US or any other part of the car, cost of the car is 20, 70% cheaper than India. So this, this is whatever is that the government made sure that the automobile industry is protected even today. That is why we have seen cars are manufactured in the country and you can see huge, huge um, ancillaries have come up. In Chennai, if you take earlier, Hyundai started, now there are thousands of ancillaries. So we need to definitely how this can be also given to MSMEs. So we also have a lot of PCB, uh, EMS people, we have PCB, a lot of small guys here, how we can support them. A lot of component manufacturing can start, but they cannot do this 100 crores, 200 crores, 1000 crores business. How we can give, keep, uh, keep this uh, type of incentive, I think uh, I will work with KRS and we can go with a white paper to come and tell them it is not supporting the major industry. How we are going to support the MSMEs also to get some incentives is going to be very, very critical. So PLI move from bigger companies also to smaller companies will be next our target to push government. This is uh, what. Thank you, Doctor. Hi, uh, thank you, Doctor Virapan. And maybe before uh, we close, if I can just uh, you know go around the panelist for a quick uh, one minute uh, to one and a half minutes kind of uh, closing remarks. Um, with regard to uh, the scheme itself or anything else that's related uh, to the topic. Uh, Sanjay, maybe I could start with you. No, thank you. Uh, and in fact, uh, first of all, uh, I think this is a, what Virapan said. This is an excellent uh, move by BCIC to educate the members first. And secondly, uh, proactively, Virapan, as you said, uh, uh, because a lot of these policies need fine tuning. Uh, I think the timely inputs to the government to make it more implementable, like what you mentioned and I mentioned as well, in terms of MSC being being covered, like Shaker said, the R&D and expenses being covered, uh, and the validation also linkage in a more tight way, you know. I think all those things uh, we should, as a chamber, uh, give the feedback to the government and make sure that they don't come out with policies which are not, uh, you know, going to be as useful to the industry as, as it is intended. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, something which we need to do. The disbursement part, I think, uh, is a larger structural issue. If you think one of the policies which has worked well is the uh, MEIS scripts, you know, when you do the exports, you got scripts. Mm. And mm. you didn't really get a check from the government, but you got the scripts which you could use it for whatever purposes. So I think if there could be a, a scripts of the kind that gets automatically generated if you submit the right kind of uh, details, uh, would be very useful because otherwise, uh, you know, getting checks out of government, uh, is, is, it has been a challenge. So, so like Virapan said, I think we need to make sure that the whole end-to-end -end process from uh, policy announcement to implementation to the industry actually getting impacted in a positive way uh, needs to be a tight loop. And I'm sure the industry can give the feedback to the government and they're willing to listen. And uh, with the right inputs, we should be able to make these uh, realize into the actual uh, impact that you're all looking forward to. So thank you again. Thank you, Sanjay. Ishwar? You're on mute. Sorry about this. I, I think we'll take a very organizational view to this. I think uh, two, three things that I would I would really be focusing on would be, I think, uh, like what I mentioned, uh, uh, how should they be really planning for this? Second is my view is, you know, look at it in totality as a larger set of uh, initiatives as you plan your investments. Because I think this is the time that you will plan your investments with the upcycle. I think the the global uh, indices are now saying that we'll be positive by the end of Q3, so it changes by the day. But at least going by what is there today, I think there are some signs of um, faster recoveries and therefore you would plan your investments. So just look at things in totality uh, from a business model perspective and then uh, focus on the right uh, segments and sectors that you would want to do. So that would be my only submission. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Uh, Ifer. Um, Bhaskar? Yeah, Tapti. Um, thanks. So in terms of the closing remarks, uh, one of the things which I forgot to mention is um, many clients ask us whether I need to just invest in the plant and equipment or can I lease the equipment, the plant and machinery. The guidelines for the electronic uh, policy says you can lease it, but of course subject to conditions. That is one quick call out which I wanted to give. The other thing which uh, Dr. Veerapan did mention in terms of uh, heightening the import duties. Apparently, I heard the CEO 
of niti ayog mr abit amitabh kant on a very pointed question he was saying that increasing the import tariffs um they may not see importing uh, increasing the import tariff because it's it's counterproductive to the domestic industry till such time the ecosystem uh, is stabilized so one of the points which i wanted to make is it's not something which is tomorrow they just announce the pli and day after tomorrow you start producing the goods so we may not see increase of the import tariff that is the second point which i wanted to mention and the third thing somewhere uh, ishwar or you did uh, allude to this point can we club this pli with other incentives as long as uh, there is no express prohibition in pli or the other scheme i think you should leverage on the schemes available uh, to the applicants or the or the industry already manufacturing or uh, dealing with the sectors which we did speak so those are the closing remarks uh, tatti from me thanks bhaskar uh, shekhar some quick close closing comments uh thanks uh, tatti um, as i said <clears throat> from a government perspective uh, we need to make sure that this pli scheme is implemented in that and spirit that is what from a chamber where we need to work towards that and make sure that the benefit gets reached to the last mile otherwise if merely on the paper it may not benefit the industry and that is what the chamber me veer up and par so all of us will work towards that that's one thing which are looking at it second one certainly uh, we need to uh represent to the government to extend it for msme sectors also because msme sector is a critical component of the manufacturing economy which i am very keen about it and the last one for the lot of companies who are seeking to avail the pli incentives for manufacturing if you are looking at manufacturing pli it's good but at the same time if you are looking to claim the lower tax rate of 15% under the income tax act then you need to set up a separate company for that and that conditions are little bit different uh, as baskar was saying leasing plant of machinery is accepted in the pli but under the income tax act where old was this new is 80 20 it should be the new plant in machinery 20% so align your pli to the income tax act so that you get the benefit of the lower tax rate so these are my uh, my closing comments tapti thank you shikha Dr. Virapun, over to you uh, for your closing remarks and for the vote of thanks. I mean, good af- good afternoon, all. I think it's a wonderful session, more than uh, one and a half hours. Yeah. I think very very useful. I think you know, the, for, for all of us, uh, I think first that we should thank uh, on behalf of BCIC. We should thank Sanjay Nayak uh, for joining us. I think it, you know his his speech was really more. Uh, most interesting and valuable and you know we we also for bcic request uh, uh, for a visit to sanjay's factory when well, place now we all have to visit sanjay you're you're absolutely most welcome most welcome yeah. and, uh, because see, wherever we you go to any factory you will see only assembly you will see now there's a huge difference between assembly and manufacturing once i went to i went to nokia and they told me you come and see manufacturing i went to nokia in chennai and saw everything They are only assembling. You know, really the the units are coming important. The keyboard is coming. Everything they are putting together only assembly. Whereas if you really go to Tejas, you will see how things are manufactured. Manufactured. So thanks, Sanjay, for uh, coming over uh, to this meeting. And you know, this is a useful, wonderful talk from you. Um, we you know on behalf of BCIC, let us thank Sanjay for this wonderful. I think let's all give a big clap to Sanjay. Then of course uh, the team of Deloitte, uh, Baskar, and uh, Ishwaran, I think both both of them. I think they have gone through the policies. Um, you know, they have gone through the policies up and down. I think they provide. When we spoke last week, they said we will not cross beyond three slides. I think thanks to both of them, they have not crossed three slides. Even though the font is small, they they made sure that they have not crossed three slides because Tapti was telling them, I will give you five minutes, seven minutes, ten minutes because you know if it is direct, at least it is interesting. when it comes to this zoom now we are we are having this call every day teams or zoom or anything now it's becoming beyond one hour one and a half hour sitting is is really difficult so i think uh, ishwaran and baskar uh, you put a wonderful uh, you know like summary of all the pla the policy now clear if you could share the slides with uh, bcic <laughs> prithvi can share with our members if it is not confidential 
No, if we can share it with you, thanks to Baskar and Ishwar and the Delight team, of course, our uh, senior VP KRS is always with us. In, in today, you know, if there are so many seminars, so many things, always KRS is there. I think on behalf of BCIC, he's a host of BCIC, but still it is my responsibility as a committee to thank uh, KRS for putting it uh, together, a wonderful show. Uh, thanks KRS for being there. Then of course, our uh, good uh, president, Parasu sir, I think uh, new normal president, we can call him as a new normal president. And uh, when we st all started pandemic, we don't know how we have BCIC going to perform. Actually, Parasu Ram sir has really taken up. We have done more programs than the normal times. In the pandemic's time, I think, uh, no. Thanks, Parasu sir, for all your support. We should thank uh, Ravi. Ravi is also there in the call, our vice president, Ravi. For all of them, the BCIC team of Prithivi, Rupa, I think, putting it together, calling the people, sending the messages, sending the link. So many things have happened. I think uh, thanks to the uh, BCIC um, administrative team for setting this up very well. And finally, I should thank uh, Tati, I think, uh, you know, comparing the show very well, taking it. And, and normally, you know, you would be, the, this will go like two hours, three hours. You have made sure that we are uh, setting a time between 11 and 1. We completed much, much earlier than uh, uh, so thanks, Dabti, for wonderful hosting hosting the event. Thank you all. We have only one yeah. point. We have only one, 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 one point. Uh, there are somebody has got raised a hand for questions. Unfortunately, we are yeah. running out of time. Yeah. So yeah. you send Tapti your is. questions to you send your questions to Tapti or Virappan or Prithvi. We will get a response to your question. Sorry about it. Okay, Sapti, Phone number of the president, please. No, you can send a question to Mr. Prithivi, might be a secretary general. Prithivi, uh, secretary, uh, our secretary general designate, he will coordinate and get the response. Don't worry about that. Prithivi's email ID will send it to you. So thanks. Thanks once again to all of you. It's a wonderful, wonderful show. With this, I think India, we will make India more and more of a manufacturing destination in electronics. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.